All right, again, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, welcome to Diabetes Cooking Club, Power Pack Your Plate with Protein. Please know that the information that you hear in today's Diabetes Cooking Club is intended as general health information. We do have a diabetes specialist with us today, but this information is not to be substituted for any medical care or advice from your provider. So if you ever have any questions about information that you learn from these sessions, please ask your primary care provider or diabetes specialist. So we're gonna pass it on to Chris to talk about our recipe. Okay, well, thank you, Tina. Again, we're here, Diabetes Cooking Club number two, and we are making 30 minute turkey and veggies chili. I have already washed my hands. Um, I am going, your, your, Tina is going to spotlight two cameras. She's going to spotlight me and she's going to spotlight the stove. And, I, and Tina, on my end, I can't see if you're doing that, but um, let me know if you are. So um, we are going to be making, as I said, a 30 minute turkey and veggie chili. The recipe is up on the screen. As I use these ingredients, I'm going to be talking about them, but in interest of time, we're gonna get the meat for this turkey and veggie chili going first. So, and then we'll get through the recipe. So Tina, just let me know real quick, do you have the back pan spotlighted? Not yet. Okay, so she's working on that. I'm gonna turn, I'm not, you're gonna see me turn around. I'm gonna turn on my stove and I'm gonna get that ground turkey browning. Now you're probably thinking, I wonder what kind of ground turkey she's using. Never fear, we are going to talk about that, but let's get it browning first. So I have my ground turkey, which is, you can see my front and my back. So this is weird for me. Um, so I, I got my ground turkey. I am gonna be plopping it in the pan. I'm going to get it browning, put my olive oil or my canola oil, whatever oil you want to use here. It's about a tablespoon of oil. I'm ha I'm happy to be using canola oil today, but you could also use olive oil. So I'm going to get my oil hot. The stove is on. I'm going to put my lean ground turkey in, which we are going to talk about in a minute, and we're going to get started. So while I'm going back there and putting my turkey in, I would like to know from this group, and this will be an experiment for using the chat. Do you like ground turkey? Yes or no? Do you like ground turkey? And the next question is, you got two questions. What dishes do you use it in? And I'll get this brown. All right, Chris, while you're working on that, we have some people that um, do use and like a ground turkey. We do have one person that says they have never tried ground turkey before, um, but most people are saying that yes, they like it. And um, tacos seem to be the winner for the use of ground turkey. Who doesn't love some ground turkey tacos, stuffed peppers, spaghetti, turkey burgers? Yes, absolutely. I love all of those things. So yes, we are using um, ground turkey that is 93% lean. And I haven't put it back in the pan yet because it's not hot. I'm going to hear it like sputter in a minute. And then I'm going to put it back in that pan. But we are using a 90% lean ground turkey. And I know I gave Tina a slide. You don't need to bring that up yet. But yesterday when I was buying the turkey, I was looking at all of the ground turkeys. And there is a really big difference in the lean turkey versus something that is labeled ground, just regular ground turkey, sometimes it will say 80, 20. And then there's a difference between the ground turkey breast, which is only as one gram of fat and which is the absolute leanest. So we'll, we're gonna talk about those differences in a minute, but I am using again, 80, uh, I mean, 93% lean ground turkey. I have the package here, which we'll go over in a minute. I already took off the, the cover. I meant to save it so I could show you. Um, but again, this is 93% lean. Let me plop it in the pan. Then we'll get back to our conversation.
And while you're cooking that ground turkey, we also have some people saying that they love to use ground turkey in dishes like meatloaf and in soups. I've not thought about honestly using ground turkey in soups. That's a great idea. Yeah, lots of good ideas for it. So it's starting to brown back there. So let's go through this for a minute. Why does it matter? Why does it matter when we're talking about what kind of turkey to buy? Because there is a big difference. So when you think, oh, 80%, 93%, Maybe that's not that much different. When it comes to the amount of fat that's in your ground turkey, it really does matter. The 93% lean or even the ground turkey breast is going to be the leanest. Kim is going to talk about macronutrients in a few minutes, so I'm not going to really get into that. But we know that the, the less fat that we consume, particularly the less saturated fat, that is better for our heart. And Kim will talk a little bit about how the heart and diabetes are related and why it's a good choice to choose the, at least maybe not the leanest, but somewhere toward the leanest cut of meat. So could I use ground turkey breast in this recipe? I absolutely could. Uh, it will be a little bit different. Ground turkey breast, which has one gram of fat is much drier. And it doesn't, It again, it doesn't have quite the flavor, but if you're really trying to cut your fat, Watch your calories. You could certainly use ground turkey breast. You can use the 93% what I use. I probably wouldn't suggest the 80-20. The 80% lean ground turkey still has quite a bit of fat in it. It's it's similar to oh, many different cuts of ground beef. So I'm suggesting 93% lean or even the ground turkey breast. So, so that's cooking over there. I'm going to continue to break it up. And let's talk through our ingredients. So we've got some kidney beans that are already rinsed and ready to go. That's going to be dumped into our chili. I've already diced our carrots and we want to dice them small for this because we want them to cook fairly quickly. I've already chopped one medium onion. This could be white, red, yellow. Most onions don't differ very much in their carbohydrate content. A sweet onion might have a few more grams of carbs, but it's not a deal breaker. So whatever you have is absolutely fine. I'm also using a poblano pepper. And I wondered if people have used this before. So can you type into the chat, have you used a poblano pepper? Yes or no, while I grind up my turkey. Well, answers are rolling in, Chris, and the majority so far are saying no, they've not used a poblano pepper. We've got one person saying yes, everybody else is saying no. Okay. I wonder, that's why I kept it whole. I see somebody said yes, I think her name is Susan. I kept it whole because I want you to know what these look like in the grocery store. Uh, poblano peppers, they're dark green, they look like a big jalapeno but they are not like a jalapeno pepper. They are much milder. And it, they are maybe between, I would say, sort of between a jalapeno and a green bell pepper, but not even. So I'm cutting it in half. Most of the heat in peppers is always in the seeds and ribs. So I'm taking that out and I'm just gonna dice this. And these have so much flavor. Every once in a while you get, you're probably wondering where I'm putting this. I have a garbage can down here. Every once in a while, you get a a poblano that is kind of hot, but for the most part, they're not. And they're just they, they they stay a vibrant green color, and I just really love them. So I am going to dice these while my beef is cooking, and we're going to use these. And again, we're going to get this all in the pot, and then we're going to move to Kim who's going to really talk about protein. So we're at our, we're at, if you're following along with the recipe, we're at number one. In a large pot, heat the oil, we've done it. Add the turkey and brown, that's happening. Then I'm going to add the onion, pepper, carrots, and garlic. So while I'm waiting to get my turkey all the way brown, I'm going to dice up my poblano. We're going to do a little bit of garlic and I wonder from this group, do you normally use jar garlic or garlic powder or what kind of garlic do you like to use? Put that in the chat for me.
My knife's getting low. What are we hearing? Garlic in a jar. I see that. What else are we hearing, Tina? Yeah, it's pretty half and half between fresh garlic and jarred garlic. Uh, and her, fresh and all, you, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I got uh, powder so, and fresh. I can see, sometimes I can see the comments, but sometimes they're too small. Dried yeah. mints. The good news is you can use whatever you want in this recipe. One garlic clove is equivalent to a quarter teaspoon of garlic powder. So if you like good old garlic powder and you don't want to use fresh garlic, that is absolutely fine. You can use garlic powder. If you use the, the minced um, or jarred garlic or even the tube garlic, that's fine too. I'm going to use fresh garlic that I'm going to put through my garlic press um, and we will be ready to go. So I got my cilantro chopped. Move that over to the side. And I wanted to show people a really interesting gift that somebody gave me. Has anybody seen one of these before? If you know what this is, let me know in the chat. No prizes today, but first one to answer gets a gold star. If you know what this little device is. Well, nobody's answering yet. Somebody says it peels the garlic. <laughs> Otherwise, no other guesses. I don't know what it is. I've never seen it. Oh, somebody says it removes the peel. So whoever said it peels the garlic, yes. Someone gave me this. Um, I don't mind getting garlic on my hands, but a lot of people don't like to. So you can put the clove inside of this little thing and supposedly uh, rub it back and forth. And it does come off really nicely, uh, the paper. So... I, I don't mind getting garlic on my hand, but if you don't like the smell of it, sometimes people don't like the smell of it. Um, we're we're having us, we're watching the class right now. Oh, was that a comment? Tina, was that a comment from someone? It was not. Okay, oh, I'm, okay, okay, okay. So I've got my garlic cloves. I'm gonna run them through my garlic press. I'm gonna hop back and check my meat. And in the meantime, let's see if we want, I'm wondering, Kim, what you think about the vegetables that we're using so far. If you could talk a minute about our vegetable choices and their nutrition value while I go back and check my meat. Okay, so looking at first things first, uh, the onion, uh, you're not looking at much carbohydrates. So in terms of diabetes, uh, use it, you know, to taste and, and often in many recipes, uh, like Chris said, you know, the red, the yellow, the sweet, um, the carrots do have a little bit of carbohydrate in terms of diabetes, but anything uh, in a portion less than like the, like a palm of your hand, whatever you can hold, is really um, not going to contribute to high blood sugars. So when you have a chili like this, it's very much blended, um, but lots of vitamins uh, for your eyes um, and carrots. Um, the poblano pepper, a lot of anti antioxidants, you know, good for immune system. Uh, and it gives a little crunch and um, color. Obviously this chili is going to be colorful, flavorful. Uh, and then when we look at our beans that we're using, lots of protein, like Chris um, has mentioned, and I'll go into that. Uh, also lots of fiber, some carbohydrate there. Um, and there's benefit to fiber, you know, for our heart, for our GI tract, for our stomach, um, but also to help our blood sugars that I'll go into shortly. Oh, tomatoes. Yeah. Eyes, lycopene, um, good, good color as well and other vitamins and minerals. So lots of vitamin and minerals shining in this recipe for sure. Thank you, Kim. I put Kim on the spot. She didn't know she was going to do that. Um, uh, but I figured we had a little downtime. So I was going to ask her to do that. Thank you, Kim. She hit up on just about all of our ingredients. Yeah. So you, thank you for doing that. You can see in the pot back there that all the vegetables have been added. So we're in step two, add the chopped onion, pepper, carrots, and garlic. I'm gonna crush the garlic and put it in. I'm gonna then let that cook for just five minutes 
And then you'll Tina is going to spotlight just the back camera and Kim because Kim is going to be taking you through the education. So I I think what we'll do now is just in the interest of time, you saw me at all the veggies. They're going to get tender. Then Kim is going to start our education and you will see me on the side. I will be adding the other ingredients. So I'll move them to step four, add the beans, tomatoes, some broth, chili powder, cream and oregano, and get this simmering. And in fact, give maybe maybe about halfway through break and give me just two minutes and I'll show them what I'm doing back there. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you for um, putting up this agenda today. So welcome everybody to this Diabetes Cooking Club. Uh, and today's uh, topic is uh, power pack your play with protein. And as you can see, um, or, or will see, uh, that variety of colors in that pan that uh, Chris is for sure uh, just mixing. And um, like I said, vitamins and minerals, always important for our diabetes. And like I said, I am a certified diabetes educator, and I'm also a registered dietitian. So today's agenda, we're going to go over you know, just the basic uh, macronutrients, just an overview of that, just so we can point out what we're highlighting. We're going to move into balance uh, with our nutrients. What are proteins? What is the serving sizes? How much should you have in a day? Is this recipe balance that we're putting in front of you and offering and cooking for you today? And then we're going to talk about some swaps and other modifications. So, um, so yeah, welcome. So we're going to look at these uh, nutrients that Tina's going to kind of pop up one by one. We're going to talk about three important nutrients in our nutrition that we should consider, especially to manage our blood sugar. So you've got your carbohydrate, which is going to be uh, food uh, classes like your grains, um, your dairy. It's going to include your fruit and your starchy vegetables. Of course, it's going to include your sweets, but we really want to emphasize those grains, those starchy vegetables, uh, fruits, and um, and uh, dairy. Today, we're going to focus on protein. I'm going to go into what that protein sources are. And of course, with protein sources comes a little bit of dietary fat. So you kind of get bang for your buck. But with all of these in our day um, and, and mixed together in some meals, we will help manage our blood sugars. So we'll go to the next slide that will show you that meals and snacks that have a balance of your carbohydrates uh, and then proteins like we're showing you today. And of course, dietary fat that comes along with those uh, proteins. All of these will help stabilize our blood sugar because essentially the stable blood sugars come from just kind of holding that blood sugar back from just skyrocketing, right? Once it's absorbed in our bloodstream, it might skyrocket. So to prevent that, having balance of these nutrients, just like today's meals, will prevent that light green uh, arch. You can see that, that, that I feel like it's a tall roller coaster, right? I don't like roller coasters. So um, in blood sugars, we sure don't like those roller coasters. You'll note the dark green um, uh, blood sugar uh, uh, over time um, just rises ever so slightly. And with a balanced meal, your blood sugars will resume uh, back to normal within a couple of hours. Uh, so with balance, it's important and not having a carb only meal or a protein only meal. It all takes everything together to make our blood sugars managed. Um, so nutrition diets um, shouldn't exclude any one of these nutrients. Okay. So with that said, let me know if you have any questions, put them in the chat. We'll have a little time at the end though for to address those questions. Okay, so let's check out those protein sources. We have to begin with meat and poultry. So anything animal is protein. Protein helps to manage our muscles. It helps to repair or build 
and or build our muscles. Protein helps to repair um, or heal wounds, right? From uh, whether it be surgical um, or maybe just a cut. Protein also has a lot of hormones um, and also other vitamins and minerals that are um, accompany it. So as you can see on the screen, we have meat and poultry. So our beef, our chicken, our ground turkey, like we're suggesting today, and pork are all protein sources, including down below is our fish and seafood. So again, any animal um, meat is considered a protein source. We'll talk about modifications certainly there at the end because there are healthier ones, for our body, for our heart, absolutely. So our fish and seafood, you name it, they're not all up there. But um, we see salmon, walleye, perch, tuna, crab, lobster, shrimp, um, Great Lakes, you know, fish, fish from the ocean. It is all considered protein. Okay, so our animal products are going to be solely a protein source as they are, as they are fresh and cooked. Okay, also including in our protein is going to be more animal sources, animal-based. So that would be your eggs, your cheeses. So the actual whole egg is a protein source with the egg white. The fat source is going to be the egg yolk. So talking in protein, the egg white is where it's at. Um, we can do lots of different things. We can talk about modifications at the end, but if a recipe calls for um, an, a whole egg, you can use two egg whites to substitute. Cottage cheese is also a protein source. I think there's five grams of protein, uh, maybe closer to 10 in uh, some cases for like a half of a cup. Um, we'll talk about those sources here shortly or the serving sizes. You know, any cheese really is a protein source. Know that any protein that comes from an animal source will automatically have some sort of dietary fat infused, whether it's trimmable. And we're going to go through that, like I said, some modifications and ways to make it heart healthier, right? So, um, and then last but not least, we come to our beans and our lentils. So when you think about beans and lentils, you might think in Kim, you said animal, animal sources are a protein, but we've got beans and lentils, which is a plant protein. It is actually a combo of carbs and protein. There is very little dietary fat. So this recipe with the, these beans, lentils, ground turkey, you've got some carbs and some protein. And on the bottom of that recipe is going to be um, nutrition facts. So uh, with your peanuts, your walnuts, your cashews, your almonds, your nut butters, uh, almond butters, nut, uh, peanut butter, soybeans, all of your beans, all of your lentils, excuse me, my light just flickered off. Give me one second. There we go. Um, it, it's a variety. But again, these come with, with a little bit of carbohydrate. So portion control is going to be quite um, important when we talk about beans. Lots of benefit, like I mentioned earlier, fiber, okay, for a healthy GI tract, fiber also helps to manage our blood sugars. It slows the rate at which it comes into our bloodstream. So it is not a fancy roller coaster ride. It is a nice, even roller coaster ride, which is nice after a few hours after a meal, you don't feel those symptoms of a spike. So with that said, those are our protein sources. There's so much to choose from, right? Animal and plant protein. So let's move on to see other sources that might have to be an option if we find that we're, we're short on time and we need some protein. Uh, for example, a protein bar. Um, there's lots out there. Oh my gosh, like thinking about um, flavors and brands. Um, there, I, not exactly one is, is beneficial. Some of them low on fat, high in protein. Some of them pack the fat and the protein, but lo and behold, there are uh, protein bars out there that might have to suffice for a quick on the run um, snack. 
I always recommend when you pick a protein bar to look at the nutrition label and be sure that the protein grams are very close or match the carbohydrate grams. That means that protein bar will be a balance. So a quick snack. We don't want one without the other. So when we look at our food label here shortly, we can note that the protein grams closely matching uh, the carbohydrate grams on the label will be a balanced snack or uh, whether it be a part, whether it be a meal, because we might skip, which is obviously not indicated for, um, for our people with diabetes, right? So I'll be curious to hear what bars we all use um, here shortly. Now I have listed their powders. Uh, there's lots of protein powders, just like there's protein bars. Um, and there's other supplements that are just protein. Um, I would save these for um, the side, unless you feel like uh, you may not be consuming enough protein or need something on the go. Uh, there are protein supplements and powders that are meant for those that want to gain muscle, large muscle mass. There's others that are just general uh, protein supplement. Um, and again, this isn't what this uh, virtual class is about, but it is uh, here an idea if we aren't getting that protein in. Uh, so again, if you're looking for a powder, um, identify one that label, it would be balance of protein and carbohydrates. Okay, so moving along, there's obviously sources that we can um, think about for protein, but what have I missed? Throw in the chat there, what other foods have not been listed that you consider to be a protein? I might have missed something, and I would love to hear um, really what we what we might consider that. Now, again, a protein to be a good source. We'll we'll flip to the uh, the next slide here. <clears throat> For our meat and poultry, for a protein serving size, we look at um, one ounce as a protein serving size. So if you wanna go ahead and put that up on the screen there, one ounce is a considered a protein serving size. That means that it contains approximately seven grams, okay? So when we think about portion size, we think about what would an ounce mean? And typically deli meat, like one slice, is about an ounce. But when we think realistically, how much are we having at a meal? Three ounces, about the size of the palm of our hand or deck of cards, is about like a chicken breast or patty size, right? So that is, you would be getting three protein servings from that chicken breast or that hamburger patty. Um, and so a steak, right? Six, eight, ounces or more, I know they're out there. Again, one ounce is a protein serving size. I will share with you kind of how to figure out how much protein you need, right? So this will come a little bit later. Last but not least on this slide is fish and seafood. So what counts as one ounce or seven grams of protein? A filet of salmon might be about three ounces, right? About the size of the, the palm of our hand. I know we all have variable palms. Um, but about the deck of a deck of card size, half of a can of tuna, right, is about three ounces. Six to nine shrimp. I know that can vary depending on if it's small salad kind or uh, we're talking about um you know large uh, shrimp is about three ounces. Okay, so those are some of our animal proteins. One ounce is um a serving size. All right, eggs and cheese, coming back to that. Uh, let's look at what one ounce may, may include. One whole egg is one protein. Um, one quarter cup of like a egg white, uh, such as egg beaters. So if you measure in a measuring, um, fluid measuring cup, uh, you would know that one quarter cup of egg white substitute is equal to one whole egg. So you may do that in recipes. It saves you a lot 
um, you're going to be cutting out the fat and continuing with the protein. So one quarter cup cottage cheese, one ounce of cheese, uh, one cheese stick, or maybe just a cheese slice. And again, there's heart healthier options for these items as well. And if you're considering um, due to food intolerances or food allergies, vegan cheese, uh, lactose-free cottage cheese, they're all very similar in protein. They are just taking out some of that carbohydrate lactose. And then last but not least is um, one ounce of protein. When we talk about our beans and lentils is one tablespoon of that peanut butter. Okay. And half of a cup of tofu. Not sure how many of you um, desire tofu, but we look at that as an option uh, for those that enjoy that um, ingredient. One third cup hummus, and then a half or quarter cup of our uh, different nuts and edamame and lentils. Uh, so definitely these are great proteins. Okay, so tell me if you use a food scale to measure your protein ounces, who weighs their food? But Tina, come back to the last chat. What protein foods did I miss? So the group shared um, milk as a protein source, and okay. then um, somebody shared um, that they really like to uh, use the Perfect Bar as a protein bar option. So it's called the Perfect Bar. Um, somebody also shared uh, utilizing Premier Protein Drink as a you know powder supplement when you need to go on the go. But then quinoa. Um, and so I shared that whole grains absolutely are a good source of protein too. Um, yes. For this question here about weighing, it looks like kind of mixed. Um, some people do have a food scale. Um, one person, two, two people are actually weighing their food and about two people are not weighing their food. So kind of a mixed bag there. Good. Well, so to begin with for milk, it is an animal uh, product and whether it is low fat, 2%, uh, it will contain the same amount of protein. Uh, however, dairy has lactose, which then qualifies it to be also a carbohydrate. So if you look at your milk label on the back, if the protein and the carbohydrate are very similar or they match, then that is a balanced um, uh, item. If it's, if it's low on one of them, lower than the other. So for instance, milk typically has about 12 grams of carbohydrates. Uh, if it is in fact much higher in the carbs than the protein for just on that label, uh, we will know that that will impact our blood sugars more than something that would have more protein in it. So if that makes sense. So milk is kind of uh, sometimes a, a half and half. Uh, but I've seen milks with much more carbs than protein. So, um, but that's a good um, pointer. Uh, make sure that uh, Perfect Bar is balanced with protein and carbohydrates. If you don't have that balance, just say the, the protein is much higher, find a carbohydrate to pair it with, right? So that's going to take a little food label reading. Uh, and then the same thing is the drink. Um, the supplemental drinks, just be sure if they're balanced, that one item is great. But if not, uh, find the counterpart. If it's mainly carbohydrates, find that protein source that would would uh, balance that out. Other blood sugars might respond differently. Okay. And then weighing food scale. Yeah, not necessary, but we can get very, um, uh, very uh, specific when we weigh, right? So we can trim that fat off and we can, you know, anything that's going to be edible, uh, but anything that we're, it is not edible. So we remove skin, we remove trimmable fat before we weigh that. Uh, that would be ideal to, to weigh that. Um, and Kim, I'm yeah. not sure you had mentioned this yet, but we've got a question in the chat. When weighing meat, should you weigh it um, after or before cooking to determine the protein content when you're talking three ounces, um, palm-sized piece of meat? That'd be prior to that, but trimming all the visible, um, uh, anything visible. Marbling is difficult to, to change, but uh, anything you, you see, trim that off, remove it, and uh, weigh that. 
Very good. All right, shall we check back in on the recipe and then uh, we can come back and finish up? Sounds good. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and then we're gonna pass it back on to Chris to see how the recipe is going. The recipe is going great. I don't know if you can see it back there, but it yeah. is looking fabulous. It's honestly done. So I wanna talk through a couple of things real quick before we go back to Kim that I missed when I was trying to get everything in the pot. So a couple of things I wanna mention about this recipe. Um, while you were listening to Kim, I was dumping things in the pot. So Kim already mentioned about the nutritional value of many of the ingredients, but I want to point out that I am using no salt added products here. And this is one way to influence and have an impact on your blood pressure as well as your diabetes because you're making your blood vessels much healthier, which are become a little bit compromised when you have diabetes. So I'm using no salt tomatoes. I did not know that Rotel now comes in a no salt added. Maybe it always did, but my grocery store, I never found it. So no salt for the best options and salt at the end. So I wanted to point that out because I missed it the first time. I also wanted to point out just a couple of things about food safety, because I, I think this is really important when you're working with raw meat. You maybe didn't notice this, but when you are cooking raw meat, only use one utensil to break up the meat um, at the beginning. And then I don't know if you noticed, but I used four different wooden spoons. <clears throat> the reason I did that was because if I'm poking that meat with my wooden spoon and that meat is raw, and it cooks another 10 minutes, and then I go back in with that same wooden spoon that has raw turkey on it, I'm contaminating the whole pot with potentially salmonella or some other um, foodborne uh, bacteria. So I used four different spoons. We gotta be careful when we're cooking with meat, especially ground meat, um, to just always employ food safe practices. So my chili has been bubbling away I also added the spices. I did not add any salt yet, but I added three tablespoons of chili powder, a couple teaspoons of cumin, a little bit of oregano, and you can mix up the spices however you like. You could, maybe you wanna make it hot and you wanna add some chipotle chili powder, or maybe you like more garlic, or maybe you wanna add um, something a little citrusy, maybe some lime at the end. So mix this up however you want, but point is our chili, is done. What's in the Rotel? What is the Rotel? What does that say? It says, what is the Rotel can? Okay. Rotel is tomatoes that are seasoned with green chili. So it's diced tomatoes and green chilies. There is original and there is hot Rotel. The original still packs quite a bit of heat, but all that's in this can is diced tomatoes, green chilies, a little bit of citric acid. Oh, I didn't know it had cilantro in it and a little bit of cilantro. So, but we've got no sodium, no added sodium in this. So, so this clocks in at a mere 15 milligrams of sodium per serving, much lower than other canned tomatoes, which run about 300. So diced tomatoes and green chilies, plain old diced tomatoes. Let's plop it in our bowl and take a look at it. And it's gonna be delicious. So, and you can see from your recipe that the serving size is pretty good here. It's a cup and a quarter of chili. And that's why we added all those veggies, right? Because veggies are low carb, veggies are low calorie. If I had a meat only chili, um, I'd have a lot more calories and I wouldn't probably be able to eat quite as large of a serving. So I have got my veggie packed turkey chili. It is steaming. I'm going to garnish mine with a little bit of non-fat Greek yogurt. Well, Kim talked about dairy products and she talked about carbs. I'm putting about, mm, that's like a, a hefty tablespoon of non-fat Greek yogurt. And Kim can talk about that. Most people would put cilantro on this, but my husband does not like cilantro. So I always like to put a little bit of herbs. So I'm putting a little bit of fresh parsley on mine. And that is about a cup and a half cup and a quarter and I am ready to go with a really nice healthy lunch. So this isn't a chili that simmers on the stove for hours. 
This is a 30 minute chili. Main thing is you wanna get the veggies tender. You want to get the meat cooked all the way through. So you do a lot of the cooking at the beginning, then that simmering with all the hot liquid at the end. Um, and that's it. And the only thing, one other thing I didn't mention, then we'll get back to Kim is the, the broth. So this recipe calls for water or broth. I had my own chicken broth that I made when I had boiled a chicken. So you can use canned, which is absolutely fine. And if you do that, look for the low or the no salt broth or stock. I use what I had in the freezer. I, I tend to make that and then freeze it, but you don't have to, you can buy that right at the grocery store. So this is our beautiful chili. I'm gonna take a bite because I, well, I'm gonna try because it's real hot. And then I'm gonna turn you back to Kim. And this is gonna be my lunch and honestly, my dinner. And it's good, delicious. Okay, back to Kim. Very good, it does look delicious. Wow, what an amazing dish. So that, uh, looking at your recipe, you can see at the bottom, uh, the nutrition information and with all of, and she's right, adding vegetables uh, with this recipe really uh, gives you that that balance, right? And, and it's not uh, too heavy on one specific nutrient. Adding that uh, Greek yogurt adds a little tiny bit of carbohydrate. Uh, but it really is going to be about 30 grams for that um, dish right there, which is pretty appropriate for carbohydrates per meal. Okay, so uh, how much protein should I have a day? So again, reminding you that one ounce is one protein serving size and that each of those each of those serving sizes, each of those ounces are about seven grams. All right, so to help manage blood sugar on a daily basis, strive for about half of a gram of protein for every pound of body weight. So basically, for an example, someone that weighs 150 pounds, really cutting the weight in half, multiplying it by a half, whichever way you are, um, whichever math design you like, um, this person would require about 75 grams of protein. Knowing that, that would mean about 10 or 11 ounces because every ounce is seven grams. So uh, when we think about that, um, you know, how, how do you guys figure out your protein requirements for the day? And again, this is very much general right? Not considering any other medical conditions, but for diabetes, this seems to be approximately uh, a nice uh, way to, to easy, easily figure this out. Throw in the chat, how do you figure out how much protein? Um, and we'll go from there. So let's look at a food label. All right, you know you need 75 grams of protein a day. Looking at the next slide, I have a food label up there. And once you know how many grams of protein approximately you need for the day, you check out right across from that blue arrow, that is what the food label tells you per serving the amount of protein. So this in fact has uh, 15 grams of protein per serving. So when you're looking at that label and wonder if it's a balanced product already, you check out the carbs there just above it right? That's 34 grams. This food item here is 15 grams of protein. It's not quite balanced. I would still have, find something to add to it. That's a little bit more protein if we're, um, if we're looking at a nice balanced meal or whether it's a snack. But where you find the protein grams is right there, right above the bolded line, you'll find grams. Don't worry about all those percentages on the side. That's for someone else. For diabetes management, I like to highlight carbs and protein. And again, dietary fat comes with most of our protein. We'll talk about that here briefly around um, in a few minutes about the modifications. Okay. So moving uh, forward, does the chili today, do you feel, meet all the criteria for a balanced meal? So let's check it out. Our carbohydrates will be our beans. That reminding you that they are um, going to be a carb, any protein source. 
our main protein is going to be the ground turkey. So we're checking off that these nutrients. We're going to get some dietary fat, very little because this is 93% uh, ground turkey. So we're going to get very little fat from the ground turkey and from the little bit from the olive oil or canola that Chris had mentioned in the pan. It is a balanced source. And we've added very, very um, robust vegetables in there that are not going to be carb heavy. So they really beef it up, give you vitamins and minerals that you may be missing for the day. Um, so did any, what did, uh, the chat say about, um, my last question there? Nobody shared how they're figuring out how much protein. That's okay. Heard. Yep. It's let, it's really left for a registered dietitian, right? Certified diabetes educator to help you figure that out. Um, so let's talk swaps and modifications. Um, when I think about the items in this, in this product, we try to strive for, like Chris said, low sodium, no salt added, uh, because blood pressure can be something common across those with diabetes. We already might have extra sugar in our bloodstream. We sure don't need to raise that blood pressure of those vessels. Um, it's hard on our heart. So the ways we can, you know, look at a food label, low sodium would be if there's 140 milligrams or less per serving. And just a little tip there. Uh, no salt added means they didn't add any extra salt. So still be careful to look at that sodium number uh, because that just means no salt has been extra, it has been added, but being sure that it's less than 140 milligrams of serving. We can always choose perhaps some fresh items versus the canned. There's no sodium if something comes from the tree or comes from the ground. No sodium at all. The soil is not adding sodium. The tree is not adding sodium. So if there's an opportunity for fresh, like the garlic, like anything you think of, that uh, beans, right? We could have used dry beans and gone through the pr uh, process of uh, cooking them, soaking them. Of course, Chris is keeping in mind the 30 minutes, right? So we want to be thoughtful of that. Rinsing our canned products, throwing them in the colander, rinsing them before we add them, the beans, the um, anything we can think of, right? Trimming all that visible fat, purchasing lean animal protein. So anything that's 90%, um, 93%, whether it be beef, chicken, you name it, that will be a lean or source. I like to, when I brown meat, when I brown any of my poultry, anything like that, I will brown that, I will cook it. I will actually wipe out the pan and then I'll add back the other products. Um, so I'm just eliminating some of that additional fat that I don't need um, in, that, in, that, uh, in that recipe. I love using spices and herbs. Uh, Chris has recommended some spices and herbs in here. Fresh is best or a powder. Stay away from things that say garlic salt, uh, onion salt, a lot of that has so much sodium, right? So um, what what other ways can I modify this recipe? What other swaps would you would you would you suggest? And while people are thinking about that, Kim, I did want to point out it says on your recipe that this is 480 milligrams of sodium, but it actually is not because I found the Rotel tomatoes that were no salt added. So this recipe is gonna clock in lower than that. Now, when I bought the beans, I did not buy the no salt beans. I bought the low sodium beans. So I don't have an exact number for you, but 480 per serving milligrams of sodium is not correct for this recipe. It's probably more like 250. So I just wanted to let people know that. Sure, you already found some modifications, right? Yep. After yep. you built the recipe. So good, good thing. Um, yeah, what are we saying about uh, swaps or mods? So we've got some suggestions. Um, somebody said they would use more fresh ingredients, maybe fresh tomatoes. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody said that they would add celery to this oh. chili recipe. And those are the swaps and modifications that we have so far. Okay, I think that is excellent. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Those so are, oh, go ahead. Tina. I was gonna say, 
we're, we're at 956. So um, we are going to open it up to any question and answers now for the remaining time. So any additional questions that you may have in regards to our recipe, our diabetes cooking club, for our dietitian and diabetes educator, or for Chris, um, please type those in the chat or feel free to unmute. And while you guys are thinking about these questions, we just got a few more slides to put up on the screen for you uh, that Kim is gonna work through and talk to us about. Yeah, so like uh, Tina mentioned, definitely talk to your primary care provider. Um, if you have any questions about diabetes um, or uh, nutrition related to that, they will help to refer you to Bronson Diabetes Education. So whether you have a, um, a Bronson provider or not, that's okay. Um, they can still refer over to me. Um, there are other locations as well in Battle Creek and Portage, because I know some of you are coming from across the state. So uh, we all are a team that requires a referral from your PCP. Uh, the, the second bullet there is diabetes self-management education. So we offer uh, group classes for those with type 2 diabetes, uh, but we also offer one-on-one -on -one there for medical nutrition therapy. So really anything nutrition related, if you want to hone in on your blood pressure, if you want to hone in on your diabetes, again, these three require, these few things require a referral from your primary care provider. No question um, for our, from our group right now, but I did put the diabetes education flyer and the nutrition therapy flyer into the chat again. And remember that that is, um, was sent to you this morning in your reminder email. We do have a couple of questions now. So one question is, uh, do you offer telehealth options? So assuming uh, for nutrition and diabetes ed. I offer, uh, yes, telehealth for the medical nutrition therapy. So the group classes are not held telehealth, but your one-on-one -on -one with myself or another registered dietitian can be um, via telehealth. Very good. And then one more question here. When using salad dressing, do you weigh it on a scale or use a measuring cup or spoon? I measure with a spoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Very good. Very good. All right. No other questions, but again, we have one more minute. So if you come up with anything, feel free to do that. Uh, we thank you so much for your time today. And I do have on the screen um, some additional resources that Bronson offers if you need assistance in any of these areas. Chris, Kim, any closing remarks for us? I do. I want to remind people that our next Diabetes Cooking Club is in April, first Tuesday of the month, and we are focusing on whole grains. So I'm going to be making two different recipes. One is going to be with quinoa. If you haven't ever used that before, come to that. That's fun and interesting. And another one is farro, which is a whole grain recipe, or a whole grain. So we're going to be doing two different whole grains because mixing up your whole grain is, it just, it, you know, it's a lot less boring than eating the same things all the time. And these are two particularly healthy whole grains. And we'll talk about that next time in April. So thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy your chili. I hope you mix it up however you want to mix it up and flavor it up. And we'll see you in April. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.